name is Henry Woodall. Uh, I was a PFC. Joined the Army in Marietta in 1962. Uh, I can tell you the reason why. I joined. I got mad at my first wife. That really taught her a lesson. But uh, I joined in 62. Went to basic training in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Uh, went to uh, advanced infantry training in the same place. Uh, went to jump school at Fort Benning. I mean, yeah, Fort Benning. And uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Graduated from uh, jump school and I got stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 82nd Airborne. My name is Joe Hagler. I spent um, 20 years in the military um, from 1980 through 2001. Uh, I was a yeoman, um, first class, E6, when I retired. My name is Arlie Tucker. Uh, I served in the Navy 24 years. Uh, started off in uh, Chicago. Uh, I'm, my original hometown was uh, Valparaiso, Indiana, and they, transferred, they sent me to Chicago for um, the testing to enter the boot camp and all. Served, uh, or I uh, graduated boot camp there in Great Lakes, Illinois and went down to Memphis for aviation training and uh, right back to Chicago, uh, VR-51, which was uh, our first command. Okay, my name is uh, Edward Windsor. Um, I was in the United States Air Force um, as an airman first class from July of 1981 to July of 1985. Um, I was stationed at Bitburg, Germany and at Eglin, Florida. I was an airframe repair specialist on uh, F-15 Eagle fighter planes. Uh, my name is Tammy Cole. I'm a special agent in the United States Air Force. I joined the Air Force in 1991. As a child, I remember wanting to come into the military, saying the Pledge of Allegiance at the uh, at school, and the American history that I really loved. So, other than that, I didn't have any affiliation with the military. No family members that I knew of at that time. But I just really wanted to come in the military. And when I was in high school, I decided not to go ahead and join because I was really close to my family and I'd worked since I was in the eighth grade uh, helping pro provide food you know for the family and I just didn't want to leave them I was that close to them so 1989 after I graduated high school I married an Air Force sergeant and moved out to New Mexico with him for two years I begged him at that time to let me join the Air Force because I loved it being around the military and he wouldn't let me so one day he went on a 30-day temporary duty and I went and talked to a recruiter. 30 days later when he came back, I left four days later on the bus going off to basic training. And that's how my career started. Actually, a lot of people think airborne, you know, after you get out of basic, it's uh, just like regular army, but it's like being in basic most of the times. And, uh, you know, never been in a plane in my life. First time I got in a plane, I had to jump out of it. And uh, and actually, to this day, it, it actually scares me to land in an airplane. <laughs> so, so uh, but it, it's a, it was an experience, but take nothing for it. Yeoman is a personnelman, basically for the officers. And we carry the secret clearances and the um, classified stuff that goes through. Spent time being an inspector and a career counselor and you know, all those other little jobs that goes with it. At that point, being the young buck that I was, I didn't, uh, didn't realize at that point I'd join into the reserves. Um, once I got to uh, VR-51 in Glenview, I was there for a month and they sent me home. I said, come back next month. <laughs> so uh, from that point, I tried to, uh, to go back to active duty and in, in my attempts to do that, I uh, found that once I became air crew uh, and flew with the airplanes I was working on, that uh, I could uh, regain the active duty status. And that's what I did. One of my best memories was getting a ride in one down in uh, Florida before I got out of the service. That was pretty interesting. It was actually exciting and fun. I wanted it to be a career, and once I came in, it definitely has been. Um, I've served in New Mexico, of course. Um, right after that, I served at Moody Air Force Base in Georgia, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, back down at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, and now I'm here at Dobbins Air Reserve Base. I'm one of four active duty members at Dobbins Air Reserve Base now. Uh, I've completed seven deployments during that time. 
to various parts of the country. Um, and no one really likes to deploy. I went through a, a recon training at Fort Benning later, and I went through Pathfinder training at Fort Bragg. Um, I started out in um, boot camp in Orlando, Florida. From there, I went to the guided missile school in Virginia Beach, Virginia. From there, I went to uh, Houston, Texas, and then transferred to New Orleans, where I was on the inspection team. I went from uh, New Orleans to um, Jacksonville, Florida, and then to Atlanta Naval Air Station for my retirement. My first detachment was in uh, uh, 1988, um, detached to Atsugi, no, excuse me, went to uh, uh, Siganella, Sicily, uh, was the first detachment. And uh, from there we'd service the, uh, the uh, service members that were out there. We, we didn't just uh, fly Navy, we flew uh, Air Force, Army, Marines, the whole shot. Um, and wherever they needed to go, whatever they needed to do. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking to leave your family and your friends and your loved one. And my last deployment when I left here was really hard to, to leave the family that I've made here at this post. And of course I cried, but. Went to the uh, Dominican Republic uh, when they had a little uprising. And while we were there, I got the nickname Cowboy. <laughs> and the reason I got the nickname Cowboy, I was on guard one night and um, I heard a noise and I couldn't see out real far. I kept hollering, halting, they didn't stop. I did what I was supposed to, they kept coming, so I started shooting. <laughs> and so, well, so did everybody else. But next morning, we went out to see what happened. It was a dead cow. So the cow didn't stop, so therefore my nickname was Cowboy for a little while. But I guess the most touching and the most mem memorable time uh, that I was there was watching my mother as we got popped ashore from the military. I took her across the, there because she was always there with me. It was her idea for me to go in. And she was always there, maybe not physically, but mentally she was always with me. She's the one I always turned to when I was down or when I was having doubts about my life and my career. She was always there for me. And when I was popped ashore, I had her escorted up and she went with me. So she was, she was my pride. One trip, uh, we kind of made this, we call it a trophy of our own. It's a globe and it was because we had flown completely around the world in eight days. Um, we had a mission to transport a um, group of people from uh, uh, the other side of the world. And instead of going there and coming back the same way, we went there and we went around the other side. <laughs> so it kind of gave us a little status of, of going all the way around the world and eight days. Um, As I was saying, one of my best memories is our squadron, we left from Germany and we went on temporary duty assignment down to uh, Sardinia, Italy, which is an island in the Mediterranean. And there was a young girl that got hurt bad in a car accident and there was a blood shortage on the island and they came and asked us and uh, I was able to donate blood because uh, I was O negative. So that was a pretty good memory. You know, like I said, no one wants to deploy and volunteer to leave their family and stuff, but once you get over there, your brothers and sisters that you're serving with, you really make a connection with those. And I guess my career is something that, I guess, you know, most women can't say that they've done or that they've had. And it's just, it's been amazing. Some of the memories that you make when you're over there and, you know, to stay warm, we, we built fires and, and little grills that the base had given us when we lost power. and. It was freezing, taking ice cold showers. And it's not something that you want to do here in the States because you have all these luxuries and stuff. But when you have to, I mean, you do it. You know, you take a shower and three liters bottles of water. You learn how to wash your hair and shower with three liters of water. And, you know, you eat what you can. And one time our helicopter broke down and we were serving over at Base X. And we were only allowed to take coolers. 
of food for a week because you'd get to come back to the base after a week and uh, the helicopters broke down and we couldn't make it back to base. So we all piled our, piled our food together and of course being from Georgia, you know, you can make a meal pretty much out of nothing and you know, that's what we did, come together and eat biscuits and <laughs> I mean, it was just great. That was about it there. It was, that was an experience where somebody ever been out of the States. And uh, I got sent back and I thought my, my dad had got hurt and, or got sick and I came back to the States and I went back to Fort Bragg and I thought I was going back to the Dominican Republic. But, uh, you know, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I know the difference between north, south, east, and west, and we weren't going southeast. And come to find out, uh, since I had uh, recon training and Pathfinder, they sent me to the Vietnam to the 173rd Airborne Recon Unit. And I served there for, uh, like everybody else, a year. And I uh, had some good experiences and bad experiences. But good ones, thank God, after a few years, you know, they outweigh the. And, uh, and that's one reason why I joined American Legion. American Legion's full of guys that have been through the same thing. My father uh, died. Um, He uh, died of old age in uh, 2001. He uh, he was uh, buried uh, November um, November 10th of 2001, and as well, no November 11th of 2001, twin towers were hit. So. That's another part of the hardest uh, parts of <clears throat> being away from home and having duty call. Uh, our command in uh, Philadelphia, where I was stationed at the time, was uh, one of the first um, squadrons that were called up to gain equipment and support for uh, the cleanup of the Twin Towers. Uh, we had a, an aircraft that was in uh, uh, somewhere on the west coast and they had to pick up some equipment in Colorado, bring it back to New York and uh, to help clean up. Um, it was the, the day of and no other planes were allowed to fly except those that were in support and our command was one of them. Um, actually, our, our unit, we'd just go down there and we'd fly against the Italian Air Force and the Germans would go down there and the British would go down there and we would uh, uh, we'd go out and they'd do dog fights and stuff. We'd, I was there for two months, um, two different times. I guess my, my best memory is when I was serving on the Honor Guard and being the, the team lead or the, um, the most ranking sergeant there, I'm, I was the one that um, presented the family with their flags. and. It was this real heartfelt, heartfelt day. When I presented that flag to the family, I saved the letter. And it said that um, he actually thanked us for the heartfelt presentation of that and of all the certificates and awards and medals I have in my book. I guess that's my, uh, that's my most favorite one. Every time I look at that, I guess that's what I'm most proud of. You know, serving even those who have gone before us. I got, I got a still praise to my squad one time, and uh, I was trying to find my cut, and I would just give out. And uh, I said, "Well, I'm gonna have to take a take a break." So I sat down, and I leaned back against the tree, and I know I went to sleep, but she didn't sleep real sound. And when I woke up, I couldn't feel my rifle, and I thought, "Oh no, they done sneaked up and got me." So I eased my eyes open, I didn't see anybody. When I went set up, my rifle hit me in the head. <laughs> I had evidently stretched and it hung up on the limb. So when I set up, it hit me in the head. And uh, it, was, it wasn't funny at the time, but it did. <laughs> you see, it's funny now. So. While I was in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, I went through, actually in Memphis, I had went through um, eight weeks of being an instructor, instructor training. So when I went, by the time I got to Jacksonville, I, I was an instructor and teaching the selected reservists how to 
um, advance in their careers and how to um, uh, dress properly, uh, conduct themselves and where they should be at certain times in their lives or in their careers and what they should be looking for. The fun part, flying around the world uh, was great. I've been a number of places. Uh, one of those missions, uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we were in uh, Asia and uh, ran into a typhoon. Um, flying around Asia, going from island to island, uh, the aircraft that we had, we would run through a number of points of no return. Uh, meaning you're flying from this island to that island. Once you hit this point, you can't go back to where you came from. You have to continue on, and there's nowhere else to land. Um, we were we were flying from Thailand to Guam, and uh, Typhoon Siomi was uh, out in the ocean and building up steam, and it was headed towards Guam, where we were headed to. We delayed for three days in Thailand. <laughs> um, uh, Thailand's quite a, uh, a place to be. But uh, we, uh, we delayed three days in Thailand to go to Guam because of the typhoon out there. And uh, it kept stalling out. It'd move a little bit and stall. It'd move a little bit and stall. And so our superiors said, you know, move on. Get, we had we had a, a SEAL team that we were moving. They told us, move on. Get those guys over there to Guam, move them on to, they got things to do. So uh, after that third day and the hurricane stalling, but still building up strength, um, we decided to move on. We watched it as we got to the point of no return and it was still sitting there and it was just off the coast of Guam. Um, of course, by the time we got to the three-quarter mark, it went right over the top of the island. And uh, a lot of us in the back, I was air crew in the back of the plane, uh, a lot of us didn't realize what we were getting into until we got there and the ride started getting rough. Um, I was a, a load master, and a load master figures the weight and balance of the airplane, how much fuel we've got, how long we can fly. I was getting real nervous because I knew about, you know, we've got the point of no return, and we're uh, getting close to that point where <laughs> we don't have anything to keep going with. Um, we got to Guam, it, it took us, I believe it was eight attempts to land. There's two runways there, one's international and then uh, the other is a military airfield. And uh, we tried the military airfield, I believe four times and just couldn't get close enough to see the runway um, to land on it. Uh, fighting winds and wind shears, uh, zero visibility, um, and on both airfields, uh, the ground, is, there's cliff at the runway. I mean, if you, if you go too low, it's not like you're going to find the ground and then it's, you go too low, you're smack into a cliff. Like I said, I was just a mechanic on the plane. Uh, they'd go fly them and then we'd fix them overnight and then they'd go fly again. So, and I got to go to Rome when I was there. I took a flight into Rome. I think it was $70 round trip back then. Uh, we stayed in the Hotel Miami in Rome for some reason, but it was pretty neat to go over there in Rome because like here you see stores and stuff down there. There's two, three thousand year old uh, stone monuments every corner you turn around. It's just pretty interesting. My daughter told me during my last deployment, she, uh, she sent me an email one day and she said, Mom, you know all those, she was 18 at the time, no, 17 at the time. She said, Mom, you know, all those times that you deployed and you know we packed up and had to move to family or friends and stuff like that she said I really didn't understand she said but I understand now she said I really don't like it I mean so that was one of the heartfelt memories that I've had and when we did land and by the way he it was a smooth landing I mean that it, it, it's like our prayers were answered all of us on board knew that <laughs> we were 
we were in trouble. Um, but it was a, a very, very smooth landing. To hear those thrust reversers power up and know that we were stopping, <laughs> that was a relief like you wouldn't believe. But this is how close we came. Our engines, as we're flying around, take off and landing, burn 8,000 pounds of fuel an hour. And um, our auxiliary power unit that we use to run the lights and, and such to start our engines, uh, it, only, it only burns 250 pounds, not 8,000, but 250 pounds of fuel in an hour. We taxied off the runway, got to the terminal, offloaded the, the SEAL team and our extra crew, had a few of our maintenance personnel because we're on detachment, stayed back to inspect the airplane and make sure everything's good to go the next morning, fuel it up and prepare it. Um, being it was bad weather, finding a fuel truck to fuel the airplane for the next day was almost impossible. They waited for about 45 minutes when the auxiliary power unit flamed out, out of gas. 45 minutes, 250 pounds an hour, 8,000 pounds of fuel to fly that airplane around the... If we hadn't landed, we wouldn't have landed. That was our last go around. I got out in the last latter part of a 65, and um, I look back on it, I'm take nothing forward. And um, that's just, just about it. Um, this, is, this is my shadow box that I um, got when I retired. Uh, this lists all my uh, duty stations, my ranks, and all my awards, uh, medals that I got. This is the last uh, re-enlistment before I retired. And this is my last cover I had. It's not a hat, it's a cover. <laughs> Like I said, that was from 81 to 83, and then I went down to uh, Eglin Air Force Base and Fort Walton Beach was a pretty good assignment because you had the beach in summertime and spring break, so that was a good, uh, good place to end up my assignment. And then I moved from there up to Georgia and started working for Lockheed Martin, um, and I've been pretty much building C-130 airplanes ever since. So it worked out pretty good for me. I mean, they're all just great. You have bad ones, you have good ones, but you just keep going and there have been uh, personnel who have really affected me and mentored me and there's those that I have also mentored as well. And it's all, I mean, it's, it's just sharing. It's not give and take, it's, it's just sharing. So, and it's just a life, a life that you, it's not a life you chose, I guess, it's a, it's a way of life. Uh, I've been all over the world from from Iceland to Brazil and completely around the norm, northern hemisphere. Uh, if I could continue to do it, I would. All the people that I've, I've come across um, and have memories of, I just, I just wish I could keep doing it. <laughs>